don't have screen sharing. Okay, we can fix that for you. Okay. Sarah's going to okay, fix I've that for it. you. Uh, I have it now. Okay. I hope uh, you guys can all see and hear me clearly. Um, and before I even start, I'm going to um, apologize if there is any issues with uh, the connection. I'm in India right now, so um, the internet is not always very reliable. Um, thank you everybody for joining, uh, joining to hear me out today. And thank you, Liz and Scott, uh, Liz and Jay and everybody um, at the Alex Lemonade stand for giving me this opportunity to present our work. Um, we all have heard a lot about uh, immunotherapy the past few times, uh, or quite a few times in this uh, series, as well as um, in various conferences these days. And I'm going to turn it around and talk about a little about macrophage immunotherapy, uh, obviously distinct from T-cell immunotherapy. Uh, a little bit of this was uh, introduced uh, very elegantly by Robbie Masner earlier on in this um, series. And I'm going to expand a little bit more on what we have been doing in our lab and why macrophage immunotherapy. Now, immunotherapy in general uh, is based upon or based around the cancer immunity cycle, which basically starts here at stage one, which starts off by the release of cancer, cancer cell antigens, which is released by the tumor cells, taken up by the APCs, eventually trafficked into the lymph nodes, uh, presented to the T cells, which then become tumor specific T cells, which eventually, in theory, can attack and kill your tumor cells. Now, most immunotherapy is based upon the T cell world or around the T cell world, essentially, the checkpoint inhibitors, PD1, PDL1, uh, and CDLA4. What we are trying to do is to see can we really modulate? the macrophage compartment within the tumors itself and which come from the periphery into working for us in that can we use macrophage immunotherapy to attack tumors. Now, one of the biggest problems for brain tumors, especially pediatric brain tumors, when it comes to uh, immunotherapy has been the fact that it has a very low mutational burden. And essentially in this graph, you see most of the pediatric tumors towards the left side of the graph. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, like I said, is the macrophage immunotherapy and a central uh, phagocytosis checkpoint called CD47, which eventually allows the macrophages to go and start eating the cell. Now this, uh, uh, taken from, and I apologize, I forgot to put in the reference for it, uh, is a very elegant diagram, which not only talks about the macrophage functions, but also the various strategies which are using for targeting macrophages for tumor immunotherapy. Now macrophages more and more are turning out to be a very key player or a central player in both tumorogenesis as well as immune suppression. But not only that, we now know that they play key roles in both radiation resistance, chemo and chemo resistance, as well as uh, resistance to immunotherapy. Uh, most of the functions of the macrophages when it normally comes to tumorogenesis arise from their function as um, secretion of various cytokines. So you have the tumor uh, promoting functions by uh, secreting various inflammatory cytokines which lead to tumor growth. They also uh, suppress um, uh, their own uh, function by, no, sorry, I apologize. They don't, uh, they also, function, they, they become polarized towards what we call as M2 macrophages, which is not exactly uh, very distinct from M1, as we now have come to know from all the uh, beautiful single cell data that is coming out. But these tend to, uh, these tend to be very immunosuppressive, prevent T cells from infiltrating in there. Um, and promote tumor growth eventually. So the various ways that they're using uh, or people are targeting macrophages has been by inhibiting the tumor promoting function or directly actually uh, blocking all the secretion that occurs or uh, suppressing the recruitment of macrophages 
um, for example, by targeting the CCR2 pathway. There is also uh, various ways by using CSF1 inhibitor, which reduces the survival of the macrophages. But what I'm going to mostly talk about today are two, uh, two major points. One is removing this phagocytosis blockade, uh, phagocytosis checkpoint blockade by using um, uh, reagents which target the CD47 SERP alpha pathway. But something that we have now started working in the lab and that is trying to use chi uh, chimeric antigen receptor expressing macrophages, which modifies these effector cells or modifies these macrophages into directly targeting the tumor cells by essentially eating them up. Now, uh, the phagocytosis checkpoint essentially works um, in the following way. Well, so we have CD47, which acts as a don't eat me signal and that binds to SERP alpha. This leads to an inhibitory signal which prevents phagocytosis from occurring. If you block the CD47 SERP alpha interaction from occurring, this will now activate phagocytosis and uh, induce the eating up of the tumor cells. One thing to keep in mind is that not only do you need the blockage of the don't eat me signal, but you actually need an activating ligand which acts as an eat me signal into, activating, uh, into binding to an activating receptor on the macrophages as well. So in a sense, oops, sorry. So in a sense, it is this balance between the eat me and don't eat me signal, which really require, which is really required to induce this phagocytosis to occur. Now, most cancer cells lack the inhibitory antigen. And if you have um, the innate immune cell, this, this will, inhibit the macrophage from going and eating the cells. If you use drugs to block this inhibitory signal, you can then use, either you use the drug to block the inhibitory signal, but you still, sorry, phagocytosis activating signal, sorry. Uh, and then you need the, you still need to get rid of this inhibitory signal, which can again be either an antibody, which itself has an FC portion, which, acts as the uh, effector portion of the antibody at, uh, in initiating the macrophage from going in and eating the cell. Or you can use drugs to do the same effect, essentially activating these eat me signals on the tumor cells, which eventually allow the macrophages to go in and eat them. So uh, the take home lesson at the end being, you need this activation of the eat me signal whereas at the same time blocking the don't eat me signal. We started this um, work and I got involved, this is back in a Weissman's lab. And essentially what we had done was uh, we threw in macrophages along with tumor cells, the macro tumor cells being in green and the macrophages being in red. You, you add in the anti-CD47 antibody and you can actually see these macrophages literally going in and engulfing the tumor cells. The thing that I really want to point out here is the presence of this uh, NSC1 and NSC2. These are human neural stem cells. And the thing to point out here is that uh, even in the presence of the CD47 antibody, you do not have phagocytosis of the normal neural stem cells. Uh, our initial studies was using a commercially available anti-CD47 antibody, which then, uh, uh, which, which we then developed a humanized anti-CD47 antibody, HU5F9G4, and it's now called Magrolimab, and is in uh, clinical trials being run by Gilead. Uh, but this particular engineered antibody had an IgG4 variant, which was used to reduce the FC function. And we went on to show that it has all these other characteristics. And when I say we went on to show this was mainly in non-CNS solid tumors as well as non-CNS um, uh, hematopoietic tumors. So initial studies were done in adult glioblastoma. This is a primary patient GBM. Um, we orthotopically implant them into uh, mice brain. Uh, which gives this massive spread in the brain itself, crossing the corpus callosum and pushing against the midline. 
we start treating them with anti-CD47, we clear them out. Uh, we have also done this in a spontaneous breast cancer model where we actually um, uh, established the tumor in the fat pad of the mice. We then went on to resect out the primary tumor and let the mice live. They not only gave rise to beautiful, uh, these lung metastases or these nasty lung metastases rather, but they also gave rise to these uh, micrometastasis within the brain of the mice, and when you treat them with the CD47 antibody, they would clear them out. Now, uh, our initial studies were done in about five different pediatric brain tumors, including BIPG, and I'll show you small vignettes from them. This is work that has already been published, uh, pre uh, which has already been published, so it's easy to look it up. Um, essentially, we do the same thing. We inject the cells, we would randomize them uh, and uh, start treating them. And you follow them by imaging. You see a uh, suppression of the uh, clearance of the tumor, rather increase in survival. And especially if you image the mice or image the brain, you could clearly see complete removal of all the uh, tumor in the hindbrain itself. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was uh, spinal metastasis or rather leptomeningeal metastasis, mainly because especially in uh, make amplified medulloblastoma, that is the uh, main cause of morbidity in these patients. Uh, we developed a, a line from a CMIC amplified medulloblastoma, which not only gave rise to uh, primary, uh, which not only gave rise to spinal tumors, but it also gave rise to this beautiful leptomeningeal spread all over the brain. And treating them with the CD47 antibody clears out not only the primary site, but also clears out the spinal metastasis. Uh, we then went on to see whether we could actually treat this by intraventricular administration of 5F9G4. And in this case, uh, what we would do is instead of doing an uh, uh, intraperitoneal injection uh, treatment, we put them into osmotic pumps and directly infuse them into the brain. And uh, we see very similar results where we see not only uh, we see clearance of the tumor, but also an increase in survival followed by an influx of macrophages within the tumor site. Um, the one thing that we really wanted to see was, does, was there an additive, was there an additional effect of infusing the antibody versus giving it intraventricular? And sure enough, what we actually see is an accelerated effect of the antibody in clearing out the spinal tumors as compared to the, uh, systemic treatment of the mice. One of the things we really wanted to focus on at this point, or at, that, at that point, had also been whether or not there was any toxicity on normal human cells, keeping in mind that this particular antibody does not bind to any mouse CD47, it only binds to human CD47. So what we did was we took normal uh, human neural precursor cells, labeled them with a red dye, took tumor cells, label them with the green dye, mix them up together, mix them up with macrophages, with and without the antibody. And then we went on to see whether or not it would take up both human tumor cells or uh, the normal cells as well. And what we really see is that it prefer preferentially phagocytosis tumor cells and not the normal cells. We went on to do this in various different normal lines with the same effect, including differentiated neurons as well as astrocytes. Um, we went on to do this, uh, uh, went on to do an in vivo evaluation of the toxicity on normal human cells. Uh, in this particular experiment, what we did was we took the normal human precursor cells and injected them into mice brain and then uh, into mice pups. We isolated out those pups which had engrafted human neural precursor cells, which we see by luciferase imaging. In this case, the luciferase imaging is coming from the normal cells and not uh, from the tumor cells. And what we see, and then we started treating them with either control or 5F9T4, and we see that it did not affect the um, 
it did not affect the normal neuro precursor cells and it only but it also increased survival something that i've not shown here so it did clear out the tumor cells but had no effect on the normal cells um, a very qualitative analysis um, was carried out as well just to see what the uh, normal behavior of the mice looked like clearly seeing on the left hand side uh, is the control on the right hand side as the mice treated with the cd47 antibody and we see the mice on the left uh, all hunched up they were cachectic fur was all messed up whereas the ones on the right on the right were healthy roaming around um, and jumping around so it had a very clear qualitative effect as well on mice behavior um, we have gone on to show this in an immune competent model as well using an anti-mouse CD47 antibody. Now this, this particular antibody, um, or rather I should say that there are actually not very good anti-mouse CD47 antibodies, so it tends to work not as well. Uh, but still giving fairly high doses of the mouse CD47 antibody, we still saw the same effect. Uh, including an increase in survival as well as an influx of macrophages. So one thing, another thing that we wanted to see was that, well, we do know that there is already a resident uh, population of macrophages in the brain known as the microglia. And this was work done by Gregor Hutter, Johanna Karuat, and Klaus uh, when we were in um, Sam Cheshire's lab um, at Stanford. And we went on to use a mouse model, which allows us to color code the macrophages and differentiate them from the microglia by using the CX3CR1 GFP, which is actually marks the microglia, and CCR2 RFP, which marks the macrophages. And you can see here that in the contralateral hemisphere, you primarily see only microglial cells, whereas in the tumor site you see both microglia as well as macrophages now what we did was that we back crossed this mouse into the not skin gamma immune compromised mouse which now allows us to have this color coded system and be able to implant xenograft into them so the first thing that we see is that even so so one of the tricks that we can use with this particular mouse is that if you have the CCR2 double knockout or the homozygous knockout, you do not get any infiltration of macrophages. Um, well, to, to, to correct this, I mean, you get very limited infiltration of macrophages into the mouse brain. And what we really see is that even when we had blocked out the entry of macrophages into the mouse brain, we still see an effect of the CD47 antibody, strongly suggesting to us that the microglia also were capable of acting as effector cells um, in, uh, when uh, the CD47 phagocytosis checkpoint is blocked. Uh, the thing that was very interesting was that even in the CCR2 knockout tumors, we, do, we did get a decreased T cell infiltration um, the CD3s were all over the place when you actually knock out the, CC, uh, the CCR2 um, knockout, but if you start specifically start looking at the CD4 or CD8 T cells, you actually start looking at fairly decreased numbers of T cells. And this is a mechanism that we have not explored yet, but something which is on our plate right now. But we really wanted to see what really happens within the tumor bed itself. So we moved to a technique called live animal two photon intracranial imaging, which is essentially a, a technique where you take the skull of the mouse, you remove the skull, you slap on a window, and now you can actually do uh, fluorescence, two photon fluorescence imaging to look at the dynamics of macrophage and mac microglia interaction with the tumor bed. Now, Shown here in green is the microglia, and the red spots are actually monocytes coming in. Uh, the blue, obviously, is a blood vessel, and this is within the tumor bed itself. Um, even though the tumor is actually uh, color-coded as well, we have not, we don't show it up. And this is in pseudocolor, so we can see the uh, blood vessels very clearly. 
what we end up doing, and if you don't give CD47 antibody, you see um, some amount of movement occurring in the microglia, but fairly, uh, uh, you see these monocytes um, in the blood vessels itself, and every now and then you will see one of them uh, extravasating into the tumor bed itself. But when you give the anti-CD47 antibody, you see this massive influx of uh, monocytes coming in and infiltrating into the tumor bed, clearly uh, showing a peripheral recruitment of the macrophages. But what really happens to the microglia itself? So we ended up uh, rendering these um, images when we imaged them for a long time, or we took a long time um, uh, video of what was happening. We do not have macrophages in here. And right now what we are seeing is the microglia sending out these long processes and surveilling the surface of the tumor cells and eventually engulfing them or phagocytosing them. So microglia are very active. They're actively surveilling the surface of the tumor cells and they're also capable of phagocytosis. So, so now uh, switching gears a little bit, I'm going to talk about one of the ideas that we are now working towards is, and not just us, a lot of labs are doing this, is how can we really make a cold tumor hot? Now, uh, the standard of care, that is chemotherapy or radiation therapy, can have two different effects depending on the reagent that you use or the radiation modality that you are giving them. It can be an immunogenic cell death, or a non-immunogenic cell death, and the non-immunogenic cell death actually giving rise to what is known as toledogenic phagocytosis, uh, which actually leads to immune suppression. It increases the Treg activities and decreases your cytotoxic T cell responses, and eventually leads to uh, tumor growth. Whereas your immunogenic cell death can, as the name suggests, lead to an increase in CTL response and overall tumor destruction. So trying to look at the various modalities which can shift your cell death towards more of an immunogenic cell death is one of the goals of the lab. Uh, how do we do this? We actually do this by, uh, sorry. We, we actually do this by increasing what is known as damage associated monocular patterns on the surface of the tumor cells. You, we know that there is a translocation of calreticulin uh, on the cell surface. There is also HMGB1 release as well as the ATP release occurring, which eventually attracts both the macrophages into the tumor bed and leads to the uh, eat me signal upregulation eventually leads to phagocytosis of the tumor cells. We've shown this with radiation. I apologize, this is not D4 to 5. This is actually an adult glioma. Um, that when you give radiation, you actually can uh, enhance the phagocytosis of CD47. This was work done in collaboration with Sam Chess's lab. Um, and we actually see a decrease in tumor growth when you combine radiation with CD47. Um, Central uh, Chetty in the lab has been now, ha has now taken this and started working on uh, diffused uh, or diffused midline gliomas uh, to see whether we can use the same modality in the pawns of these mice to see if radiation can combine with CD47 therapy. And sure enough, even at high tumor burdens, when you combine fractionated radiation with just one week of CD47 treatment, we start seeing a significant decrease um, in the tumor volume. And this has been taken out for more than a week now, and you start seeing an increase in survival as well, shown here. He's done it with a, a cell line called BT245, which is a thalamic GBM. I apologize, I don't know why these are uh, squished together, uh, but we have seen this in both BT245, which is a thalamic GBM, as well as a, as well as DIPG17, where we see an increase in survival when you combine um, radiation therapy with CD47. Uh, we have also looked at the phagocytosis of DIPG17 cells upon fractionated radiation, and once again, we clearly see an increase 
when you combine fractionated radiation with CD47. Um, and Senthil has gone on to show that you do see an increase, a significant increase in calreticulin on the surface of these DIPG cells. One thing we wanted to check is what happens if we actually give sublethal doses of chemotherapy. And this is basically meaning that we are giving doses where you do not really see significant cell death, but um, using a very commonly used um, chemotherapy regimen of CCNU, uh, Wincristin, and Cispatin, we actually uh, see that even at sublethal doses, you can increase phagocytosis when combined with CD47. Now, at this point, we have to really go back and look whether this is happening from an immunogenic cell death perspective or this is simply aphrocytosis. Because one thing now we need to keep in mind is that if it's simply aphrocytosis, we could actually be inducing immune suppression. This is something which is ongoing in the lab right now. But now we have to make that distinction whether this phagocytosis is now occurring from aphrocytosis or just, or just live cell phagocytosis. Um, a study that we carried out or have been actively carrying out with Mark Remke's lab in Dusseldorf has been the epigenetic regulation of immune evasion in MIC driven medulloblastoma. Uh, what we essentially did, this is a manuscript which is now under review is that Mark ended up looking at a whole bunch of FDA approved reagents and then uh, separating them out based on those which had very high activity against MIC amplified medullose specifically. So everything which is below the uh, group two and group three was discarded because these had very high IC50s and we started focusing on those which were really had these low IC50s and those which specifically had low IC50 for MIC medullose. And one of them that we came out with was CI994, which is a HTAC inhibitor. Now CI994 has very nice specificity for MIC medulloblastoma compared to GBMs, ATRTs, or other medullose. Um, seen here looking at the um, IC50. This was work done by Victoria Marquardt and Joanna Theruwath in the lab at that time. Um, CI994 induces apoptosis, and in fact, it actually downregulates levels of MEC um, in, uh, in the treated cells. But more importantly, by using this UW228 line, which had um, low MIC to start off with, if you overexpress MIC in it, you actually increase the sensitivity of the cell lines with uh, to CI994. And you do get some, some level of single agent activity even in the mice. However, our interest really came in when we started looking by, uh, when we started running RNA sequencing and methylome analysis at low doses, of CI994 on the, uh, on, on the MIC amplified cells. And to our surprise, the top hits, which actually started getting, which started getting pulled out, were those which were um, associated with innate immune activation. So you had your upregulation of TLR4, interferon alpha 2, NF kappa B, TGA beta 1, and interferon gamma. So this really led us to Think whether do you th to think whether we can really start using this as a mechanism or as a way to tease out how immune evasion works in MIC amplified medulloblastoma. And we went on to do a preclinical analysis to see whether it really combines with CD uh, um, CD forty seven. Uh, and sure enough, not only it increases uh, the phagocytosis of CD forty seven at low doses but it actually significantly enhances the survival in these MIC-driven medulloblastoma xenograft mice. Um, this is a study which is still ongoing in the lab, but just um, looking at this sensitizing or immunizing the tumor cells, 
A couple of things that we have seen is that if you look at patient samples and look at the surface expression of CD47 on some of the patient samples that we got, you actually see an increase in CD47 expression in the group three, that is the MIC amplified medulloblastoma lines as compared to the non-group three lines. We have seen this both in a uh, uh, allograft mouse model, one which was developed by uh, Bob Rexorrea, the MIC GFI P53 model, um, and especially when you compare to two different um, sonic hedgehog mouse models, you clearly see an increase in CD47 expression on the surface. We have um, also um, looking at a new reagent that is a direct MIC inhibitor, that is MIC CI975, which shows exclusive, exclusive sensitivity to D425, which is a heavily MIC amplified line. And not only this, this actually starts inflaming the tumors that is increasing nf kappa b expression um, when you treat MIC amplified lines with um, the MIC, I, MIC CI975. We have to obviously go back and do all the controls and knock down MIC and do all the experiments there, but this is extremely telling that um, just modulating MIC levels, you can actually start going after and starting to combine them with CD47. Uh, there are obvious links to the adaptive immune system, which is ultimately where um, everybody wants to go to. Can you really drive the adaptive immune system? Um, so the answer to that is yes. However, we have to be very careful on how we are driving this. This is something that we really wanted to see. Can we combine CD47 with uh, PD-1? But the take home lesson from this slide is that you cannot just throw them together. That is, you cannot just take a tumor and throw both CD47 and PD-1 together. You actually, if you combine them, you do not get an, any effect which is more than CD47 alone you have to start treating them simultaneously, uh, sequentially, meaning that you first give CD47 for a, a couple of weeks, you wait for a washout period, and then go back and give PD-1. And that is when you really start getting this uh, increased effect uh, or increased survival in these mice. So uh, timing is just as important as the reagent that you are using. And lastly, uh, or not but least, we are also starting to look at chimeric antigen receptor expression macrophages. We've all heard a lot about CAR T cells and, their, um, and all the fascinating work that has been going around it. But uh, we wanted to really see that can we make macrophages function and behave in the same way as CAR T cells, that is, uh, that is essentially providing them with a homing mechanism homing and activating mechanism, which can make the macrophages go into the tumor cells and eat them. Um, and why we really want to, why we are focused on uh, CAR macrophages is that macrophages or monocytes especially are designed to infiltrate into solid tumors as compared to T cells. And so uh, this is just a proof of concept that we very recently did in the lab. Uh, and this was a combined effort from uh, Eric Hoffmeyer, Alison Cole, and um, Senthal. And what they essentially did, so in this case, we are using Raji cells and we are using the very standard CD19 car, um, which, is, uh, uh, which has been very well tested um, uh, a number of times now. And so we made these macrophages with the CD19 car and fed them Raji cells. In this case, do keep in mind, I'm using GBM as a control because GBMs normally do not have, uh, GBMs do not express CD19 on the surface. This is slightly opposite to what I've been talking about till now. The Raji cells are the target cells here. And what we really did see is that uh, if you look at the blue and the green, that's just Raji cells with just macrophages, whereas the blue is the GBM cells with the CD19 car. They're both don't respond because uh, one doesn't have the car on it and the other one doesn't have the target on it. Uh, you add the GBM with, uh, see, even with the CD19 car and CD47, you do see an increase in phagocytosis. But more interestingly, the Raji cells really get uh, very um, rapidly eaten up 
But what really surprised us was this massive increase in phagocytosis when you have both the CD19 card as well as the anti-CD47 antibody. So this is a proof of concept to show that uh, macrophages can actually go. And this is nothing new. Also, I must admit, uh, Charisma Therapeutics, uh, there's a whole company behind it coming out of Sargill's lab, as well as some, um, some really beautiful work which has been done by Cotton Crane at uh, Seattle Children's. Um, and this is something that we have now picked up to see whether we can use these in pediatric brain tumors. So, so the one big question comes is that are all macrophages equal when, when it comes to eating? This is again something very new that we have started in the lab. We really wanted to see. So one thing that we have always seen and noticed is that there is always a threshold of how many macrophages we can really get to eat tumor cells. And depending on the donor from where we get those macrophages, it can range anywhere between 20 to 30% at best. And that is something which we have tried over and over again, no matter what we try, we can never make more than 20% of these macrophages actually start eating. Even though the way they are cultured and the way they are isolated, it's all the same, only about 20%. And it's, it's been in culture for anywhere between seven to 10 days. Um, it never really goes beyond that. So we wanted to see what was really this difference between eaters and non-eaters. And so what we did was that we started the macrophages, we, we combined the macrophages with tumor cells um, and we let them go for 24 hours and then Centel sorted these uh, double positive, which we labeled them as eaters and the single positives, which was the non-eaters. And then we did single cell RNA-seq on it. And we're still deconvoluting this data to figure out, but a um, couple of things which already came out. Number one, there are actually two very distinct clusters which come up, two being the eaters and one being the non-eaters. You can see uh, uh, the eat eaters um, uh, separating out from the non-eaters, but there was also very differential gene expression occurring. These are the top hits. And this is just the very surface of this massive gene list that has been created now, um, that there are actually differences in what are the top genes, whether you're, when you treat them with CD47 and when you don't. So clearly there is, there is this heterogeneity which occurs not only in, in the macrophage population, but also in the actual functional phagocytosis or post phagocytosis um, in, within the macrophages as well. And um, uh, just to give you a flavor of it, in the non-eaters, you have, you know, you still have cytokine signaling going on, you have leukocyte activation going on, uh, including in interferon gamma-mediated signaling, but clearly in the eaters, you have lysos, lysos, there's a huge increase in the lysosome genes as well as the phagosome genes. Um, but what we have also seen did not um, really show up here, but we do see some increase in antigen presentation genes also occurring. So this is something we hope to be able to present to you um, down um, uh, in the future and sometime in the future. So um, that is pretty much the end. Uh, we, uh, the, all the 47 story actually started out uh, in Irv Weissman's lab. And uh, when I was working with Sam Cheshire, who has a lab in Utah now, and we're continuing the collaboration. Um, and uh, I, need, I would like to really thank my colleagues at the Pediatric Neuro-Oncology, especially uh, my lab, and I apologize. Oh, this is an old slide. I really apologize for this. My lab, which is Alison Cole, um, Senthil, um, Eric Hoffman, and Jocelyn Cruz, uh, who are, I think, in the audience today, and I apologize to them for not having the name here. Um, Rajiv Vivakar and Nick Foreman, who have been excellent mentors, as well as Leah Gore, who has um, supported, uh, um, supported the work which has been done in the lab, and especially the Morgan Adams Foundation. And at this point, I will start reading out um, the questions. Right. Thanks, Sid. You can go ahead and read the questions, and then if anything gets past you, I'll um, jump in and let you know. We have about 15 okay. minutes left. Okay. Uh, so Pyle, uh, Pyle asks whether 
sector, um, if I think our NK cells may have a role to play in tumors such as DIPG and glioblastoma. Actually, Payal, that's a very, very good question, especially because if you see, there were um, these two fabulous papers. One came out of Michelle Manje's lab and one um, uh, from Nick Vitanza from Seattle. And one of the things that they both put out, I think it was in Nick Vitanza's paper, actually, which really talks about um, which, re which really talked about uh, uh, NKGD, I believe, which makes the cells, which which suggests that NK cells actually may have an activity in these um, in these models as well, especially DIPG and GPM. So the answer to your question is that this is probably something which uh, would work. Um, and the second question is from Todd. Todd, yes, um, the signaling domains are actually, are very surprisingly, I must say the same that is used in CAR T cells. So this one actually has the same CD3 zeta, uh, which uh, has a very, um, has the same signaling pathways as well as sequence, a very similar sequence to the FC gamma R2A receptor. So it actually starts, um, it has the same signaling mechanism or activates it in the same way. Um, I was very surprised to see how well it actually does work, um, even though it's a, just a CD3 zeta. And those are the only two questions here. Do you have other questions out there that people haven't posted yet? Give it a second, I think. Oh, there we go. Oh, feel free to ask less nope. questions here. <laughs> Guess you had a very thorough presentation. Or I was too fast. No, I don't think you were too fast. Any other questions? So I guess I had a question and, you know, you may have explained this scientifically, but to my layman's brain, I, it, I missed it. Do you think this has specifically better applications for medulloblastoma and or brain tumors than other types of solid tumors? Or is that just your expertise? So that's why you're applying it. So this is just my expertise. I mean, in fact, some of the best data has come from non-CNS tumors. Um, they, have, they have done some clinical trials with, uh, they have done some, I must say, successful clinical trials with um, uh, hematopoietic tumors or liquid tumors. Um, they have also done uh, with myodysplastic syndrome. And, uh, and I believe there are ongoing trials with lung cancer. So, so okay. th this is this is a very common mechanism. It's it's highly conserved. It's a very common mechanism. So it's being done very rapidly in multiple different tumor types. Okay. But here, my expertise is of of course focused within the pediatric brain tumor. Brain tumors. Okay. 